See, my heart skips a beat. You guys noticing that? My heart skips a beat every time we meet. I don't know what to do. I'm so in love with you. See that? I'm wearing my Marvel t-shirt. Who can see me doing that to my pecs? What's up, Caldina? Look at him pecs, baby. I haven't hit weights in about two months, so I've lost all that muscle density because there is no gym to go to, but I've been trying to walk so I can burn calories so I can lose that 50 pounds and keep it off. I lose it, and then Ed will find it. Ed McMahon. You see that? Who can come on, guys? Who can do this with their pecs? No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. How about this way? This was, these are remnants from my days as a bodybuilder. Okay. Joanna, yes, I used to work out. I said, wait, but it's been two months. I was trying to get back and hit weights again, get my muscle tone. But because of a, a flu I got two months ago and then the coronavirus, all I've been doing is walking. And I hope by the grace of Jesus Christ, I keep walking, burn some calories, get my cardiovascular health, right? <clears throat> okay. Because you can see my shoulders are not dense anymore, right? But see here. Come on, guys. Who can do this? Come on, ladies. You see that? How many men can do this? You got to be gifted like me. I'm the most gifted apologist in the world. Not only am I gorgeous, I make bald look beautiful, right? Look at this. Look, come on. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. See that, Ma Magdalene? Don't don't melt, Magdalene. You know, I know you're, you know, it's like you're melting like butter in my hand. What's up? What are you? All right. <laughs> Protestant got back. Man, Protestant, if I didn't know anybody, you're an apologist. You just, what a good comeback. You see that refutation? Big question is who wants to do that? See that? You know this guy's been training to debate. Man, I hope so, Vento. You know. All I can tell you is that underneath this shirt is just one hairy chest. <clears throat> oh, I thought you, oh, I'm sorry, Magdalene. I thought you were saying that I practiced to shake my uh, pecs. I'm going, to, I haven't been, ha I didn't have time. Thanks to our sister. She sent me a tutorial to try to work it out. I haven't been, I didn't have <clears throat> enough time to do it yet. I'm hoping I'll have some time either tonight or tomorrow because my brother just moved in. For you guys, for you guys who don't know, my brother joined me just, what was it, Sunday he got here. Because I came here and I got a place for him and I, so my brother's here. So he's been settling in. So glory to Jesus Christ, my older brother is with me now. And just to let you know, a little background. Yep, Sal, how you doing? How'd you know Sal? Satu Jam Saja, how'd you know that? You're kind of scaring me because you got an Indian name. Abdullah Aman is here, folks. Abdullah Aman is here. This Muslim who is hungry for the truth and he's seeking the true God. Pray for him. God is really touching his heart. Pray that Jesus Christ, our Lord, will bring him to the feet of the Son of God. That the Lord Jesus will bring him to his feet and bless him because he's hungry. But to let you guys know, I'm the youngest of six. We're four boys, two girls. The brother that's living with me is the second youngest. He's the second youngest. I'm the youngest. So he's about seven years older than me. And in my time of need, when I was going through my trials, the Lord Jesus used him to be there for me. And he took me in, helped me out to get on my feet. And now, by the grace of God, I'm returning the favor. I got a place for him and I. So now he's here with me. So glory to God for that. If, if I, I, I have a testimony to share when it's all said and done, how good Jesus Christ has been to me, his faithfulness, his goodness during my trials, one of the biggest trials of my life that lasted for two years. And I'm still not completely out of it, but he has shown up in a way to protect me and preserve me. And I beseech my God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to protect my angels, my daughters, and flood them in his love, keep them whole by his spirit, and Confirm to them that I do love them and we will be together by his grace and his <clears throat> perfect timing in Jesus' name. So my God is infinitely good. He is infinitely good and he is 
life itself, and he is risen. We thank you, Lord Jesus, right? So with that said, let's just ask the Lord to bless. I'm going to do two sessions, God willing. Lord willing, I'm going to do this session, and then I'm going to do another session before Haterwood goes live. He's going to go live around 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to do a session about two hours before that because I wanted to do a session on how Muhammad, again, ends up proving that Jesus is God. But there were some things about prayer I wanted to discuss in a little more depth. So glory to the trying God. <clears throat> Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you and we need you and we depend on you. Thank you, Father, that you've been using these sessions and anointing me by your spirit to bless your people. Father, please strengthen us. Transform us by your spirit to become more like Jesus Christ, to love you more passionately, to trust in you more perfectly, and to live for your glory more powerfully, more completely by the power of the spirit, to be in love with Jesus Christ, to trust in Jesus Christ, to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, to be purified, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and fill us with the Holy Spirit, Father. Fill everyone here with your Holy Spirit. And Father, you see that this man, Abdullah Man, is here. This man is seeking, Lord, because he's here. Although he's a Muslim, he wouldn't be here if he wasn't seeking, and he wouldn't be seeking if the Holy Spirit wasn't touching his heart and drawing him to the Son of God. So we trust that the Holy Spirit, who is drawing him, will then open his heart completely to fall before the feet of Jesus and escape the darkness of Islam for his salvation, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you bless this session, Lord. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need just to glorify you and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. And Father, fill me with such wisdom and knowledge to plunge the depth of Scripture and to interpret Scripture perfectly and correctly and enable me to recall the passages perfectly, not to forget, Lord. And then give us the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Word of God, not just to hear it, but to live it in the power of your Spirit with passion to love your word, to proclaim your word, Lord, <clears throat> to show that we truly love Jesus Christ and we're in love with Jesus Christ. And may Jesus sit upon the throne of our hearts. All our hearts are the throne of Jesus, your son. And I pray that the throne of our Lord Jesus will expand into the hearts of everyone, every creature. Every heart of every creature will be the throne of Jesus because they were created for his glory to know him, to love him, and be loved by him. And I pray that you will capture the hearts of my daughters, even their mother, to be the throne of Jesus. Cover them, cover us and our loved, loved ones with the blood of Jesus and fill us with the Holy Spirit and save me from stammering. Save me from confusion, Lord, please. And save me from being a stumbling block. And save me from, <clears throat> from stumbling if someone's here to attack. And beatify me for the, for the glory of Jesus. And let the light of Jesus shine through me, shine through us. And bless the connection for your glory, Lord. Please, Lord, be with us. We need you. <clears throat> Have mercy, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. <clears throat> As you can see, my throat's still a little dry. So we're drinking coffee, which supposedly helps it. Satu, how did you know my brother Sal, your pal? Because you have an Indian name. Satu Jam Saja, unless you're a Syrian masquerading as Indian. Don't be ashamed of your ethnicity, bro. <laughs> Glory to God. The Lord has been blessing these sessions too because we now have reached about a 180 mark, which for me is a lot. For David Wood, that's nothing. But in time, for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men, we're going to have about 900 in time. What's up, Sahi Christian? Al D, your boy is right there, Sahi Christian. That's right there. He's an Assyrian, right? You guys, you want you want proof for predestination? Honestly, one of the proofs that predestination is true. You guys want proof that predestination is true? Mm -mm. One of the proofs, experiential proof that predestination is true. Sahi Christian is proof of predestination because if I had a choice, I'd never see this guy ever again. For the rest of my life. But I have no choice because it's predestined for this guy to be a thorn in my side. What more proof do you need than that? Right? Hey, by the way, Sai Christian, did you listen to me on Christian Prince's show last night? Your hero? My boy, Christian Prince. Were you listening to that session? 
I was actually on Christian Prince's live stream yesterday. I love that man. I don't say enough, but I, you know, I, I like to acknowledge the work of Jesus Christ, my Lord, in the life of other Christians and warriors of the faith. I like to give Christ glory for the men and women he's raising up, you know, to testimony how good Jesus is and how faithful he is in raising up warriors. And I just want to say I love that guy, man. I love Christian Prince. I really love him. Right? I love him. He's a great man. Magdalene, you were up kind of late yesterday, weren't you, listening to the show? You're, you're up very late. Hey, don't let the camera deceive you. It adds 50 pounds. Hey, you know, one time we're gonna, we're about to begin. I'm just waiting for a few more minutes for the modem to warm up so it doesn't buffer and for a few more faces to show up. Hey, uh, one time David Wood took a shot at me. Was it David Wood? Someone. I said, hey, man, yeah, you know, they say the camera adds 50 pounds, right? He goes, man, there must be 10 cameras on you. Did you get that? I said, hey, man, the camera adds 50 pounds. He goes, there must be 10 cameras on you. Get no respect. Well, that's okay, Magdalene. Some people need to get a lot of sleep because they need beauty sleep, like Sai Christian. He needs to sleep like 12, 13 hours a day because he needs a lot of beauty sleep. But God has made you beautiful. You don't need to sleep. Stay awake. But Sai Christian, you need to sleep a lot more because with a face like that, even a mother has a hard time loving. By the way, Sai Christian, is your face hurting you? Because it's killing me. <laughs> Sorry. See, I would have been a great comedian, stand-up comedian, but sitting down. Uh, Yahya Ibrahim, you're a liar, and you know you're a liar. You're not here to learn. You're here to ask questions to attack the Christian faith. And if you do that, I'm going to embarrass your prophet, and I'm going to shame your prophet, and I'm going to expose your prophet for being the son of Satan. Did you notice what Yahya Ibrahim, look how he does it. Sam, I'm here to learn about Christianity. In other words, I'm going to attack your Bible and your God, but you can't attack Muhammad because I'm just here to learn Christianity. Can you believe these guys? Hey, Leah, is that a compliment? You said I have the same personality that your dad does. Is that a compliment? Is he as good looking as me? She's fresh, she's so fresh. Panos Filippo. Uh, Filippo. Panos Filippo, that's a Greek name. Panos Filippo said you look fresh. You know what that reminds me of? You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of a song. She's fresh as so fresh, exciting, fresh as a summer breeze. She's so fresh. Okay, these are worldly songs that I memorized before I came into the faith. Now I'm saved, okay? I don't sing those songs anymore. But you guys don't want to – what band was that? Anyone remember that band? We're going to start about two minutes. I'm just waiting for the regular show up. I think Louis sent them, right? Remember? She's fresh, just so fresh, exciting, fresh as a summer breeze. She's so fresh. All right. You guys got to admit, we, we lived at a time where the music was fresh. The music was the bomb. 70s, 80s, there was nothing like the music, music of the 70s, 80s. How about this one? Whoa, here she comes. Watch out, boy, she'll chew you up. Whoa, here she comes. She's a man eater. Remember that? Right? Everyone got that? Come on now. Right? Leah, you, I guess your dad must be a wise man because your last name is Wise Man. So is your dad a wise man? Leah, wise man? Okay. Hey, Protestant, are you here? Could you tell, by the way, could you tell? Yes, the Cool and the Gang had a lot of great songs. Could you tell, by the way, that I wanted to become a Hollywood star? Could you tell when I told you that part of my testimony, before I came to the faith, before I became a Christian, I used to bodybuild and kickbox so I could use that to get into Hollywood. I wanted to be the first Assyrian star. Could you tell? Right? Right? I mean, could you tell that? But anyway. Anyway, with that said, Protestant, you here? Yeah, Joanna, I wanted to be in the movies. But see, Joanna, I know Hollywood wasn't going to take me as an actor, Joanna. So I was going to go to Bollywood. I was going to come to New I was going to do it like Bruce Lee. Look, Bruce Lee had to go to Hong Kong in order to make movies to get the attention of Hollywood. And he did. I was going to go to Bollywood. I was going to go to India. 
and I was going to appear in these movies and they were Turti Tupi Wali. Karate kid, what do you do? What do you get, man? Can I do that, by the way? Can I imitate Indians without them get offended? Because you're my brother, sisters in Christ. How dare you make? I'm not making fun. I'm just saying. Let's be honest, right? Okay. Don't they talk like that? What it did? I don't like what it did, man. Karate kid. Karate kid. Why karate kid? All right. Gee, Sai Christian. Coming from you. <laughs> All right. Okay, now with that. I love you too. Sud Hacker Steven. Man, what is this name, man? Sud Hacker Steven. Why don't you make it harder for my list? Kutsari Kari Kurti. Kari Kurti Telku. All right. All right. Let's get let's get now with that as a warm-up. Don't forget, God willing, after this session, I'm gonna do another session. And Lord willing, I'm going to practice on how to set up a live stream in a day in advance. I have a tutorial sent by this precious sister, the Lord bless her, to walk me through it. So I'm gonna see if it works on my Mac. And so that will give me the advantage of setting up scheduling a session in a day in advance. So I'm going to try to work it when I have time, sometime this week, God willing, Lord willing. Oh, and by the way, today is Sai Christian's birthday. It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Sai Christian. Everyone, I want you to wish him a happy birthday. Okay. Okay, Sai Christian, say happy birthday, bro. Yeah, no, it's his birthday. So happy birthday. Yeah. yeah, it's April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day. Happy birthday, Sai Christian. <laughs> I set you guys up. April Fool's Day. Happy birthday, Sai Christian. You know, Fool's Day? See, Protestant believer, you got it, didn't you? <laughs> Protestant is, is sneaky. You got it, man. Okay, with that said, now that we've lightened up the atmosphere... Now that we've lightened up the atmosphere, now that I got your spirits going, we're going to trust the Holy Spirit to take over, the Holy Spirit to fill us, to glorify Jesus, to love Jesus, to magnify Jesus, and to help me interpret the scriptures correctly. <clears throat> I want to talk a little more about prayer because there are some other passages I didn't get into that I want to unpack. It passed on to where you are. No, actually, no, Magdalene. It's April 1st, and it's still April 1st. Because 12 a.m., it'll be April 2nd. But it's 12 p.m., it's April 1st. But I think you guys, yeah, you guys are close to midnight. All right, with that said, you folks, let's get into some more examples from the scriptures where we find the Lord Jesus Christ and his followers, the Lord Jesus Christ commissioning his followers to pray to him and his followers actually praying to the Lord Jesus, right? So everyone, no, over here, we're still April 1st because in the UK, Europe, you you, you are ahead of us. So when it becomes April 2nd there, it's still April 1st here. But now I want to show you from the scriptures. I hope yesterday brought some clarity. I hope yesterday. So, yeah, hey, Ibrahim, if you are sincere, if you are a sincere seeker of truth, I don't mind answering your questions. If you're here to pretend that you're seeking truth, but to attack and mock my God, you're not going to last in my channel because I don't know who you are. You have a Muslim name and I welcome, just let me be clear. I welcome everyone from any theological background, even agnostic and atheist. Look, we have Andrew Martin. He professes to be an atheist. You can come here. You can ask me tough questions if you're asking sincerely. If you're not here to ask just to attack, or to debate, or to mock or ridicule my God. I don't care. Uh, this my channel is for everyone. I want to strengthen Christians, but I also want to reach unbelievers, because Jesus Christ, our Lord, has commanded us to make disciples of all nations. Our Lord has commanded us to reach the unbelievers and bring them to the feet of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're sincere, I'll answer your questions. But if you're here pretending you're sincere, you won't last. This is not a channel for people to come and attack and mock and ridicule my God. You want a debate? Set up a debate. 
set up a discussion. You can call me on Skype, which, by the way, reminds me. I'm going to have to open up my Skype in a minute. Hold on one second. Because I challenge another Unitarian. See, I'm going to control my tongue. Another Unitarian. Yeah, these Unitarians, man. They're the most wicked blasphemers because they claim to be Christian. So I'm hoping he contacts me. If he does, we're going to have an impromptu debate. And by the way, thou shall not pontificate. Did you let our sister know that I'm live? Because I want her to watch and benefit from the session. Now, with that said, what I want to do is I want to give you further examples where Jesus' followers, those who walked with Jesus, those who talked with Jesus, and their disciples would pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, would cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ, would invoke the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Right? Showing that according to the Bible, you as a Trinitarian who worships the triune God can pray to the Father in the name of the, in the Lord Jesus, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you and teach you how to pray. Or you can pray to the Son. You can even pray to the Spirit. Or you can pray to all three in the same prayer. Are you with me there? You can pray to all three in the same prayer. Are you with me there? I hope yesterday I gave you ample proof from the scriptures that's the case. So those of you who did listen, I think I gave you ample proof. I didn't give you every example. That's why now when you read the Holy Bible, when you open up, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate you and guide you and show you all the places in which you see them praying either to the Father or to the Son or to all three where they're praying to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because that's the pattern of Christian worship. That's the pattern of Christian worship. As Trinitarians, we speak to, we invoke, we make our requests known, and we praise, and we thank, and we love, and we adore the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because prayer is not just worship. Prayer is not just invoking, asking God for your needs. Prayer is conversation. It's communion. It's fellowship. It's speaking to the one you love. It's having fellowship with the one you love. It's having intimate communion with the one you love. And you're supposed to have intimate communion, intimate conversation with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because these three persons are the one God that created you, that made you, that sustains you, that loves you and preserves you. So you are to thank, love, speak to the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And that's why if you notice even my prayers, you'll notice that my prayers have a Trinitarian shape to them. I will glorify, praise, and love the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and I'll invoke all three because that's my God. The Father is my God. The Son is my God. The Holy Spirit is my God. And they're not three gods, and they're not the same person. Three distinct persons, three eternal relationships that do all things together perfectly as the one God. And that is the God who is in love with you. That is the God who loves and adores you. The Father loves you. He adores you. The Son loves you. He adores you. The Spirit loves you and He adores you. So you love and adore them in return. You love and adore them back. Is that clear? Everyone got that? And I gave you examples where you can do that, where you can speak to the Father, speak to the Son, speak to the Spirit. And I'm going to give you further examples. Remind me to touch on the Lord's Prayer. God willing, if you pray for me, that the Lord will give me the health I need and the holiness to delight his heart, to love him and obey him, not just lip service, the provision to do this. I do want to do a session on our Lord's Prayer and break down every statement in our Lord's Prayer. But let me just give you a suggestion. I want you to search online for this book called the Didache, okay, Didache. This is an early manual. Scholars believe this was written, Father, Son, Spirit, please, Lord. Please, my God, Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit, Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay, sorry, like I said, it's going to buffer. Hey, what can we do? Okay, now, scholars believe this Didache, listen to this. This I need you to really listen to this. Didache. I mentioned this in one of my previous sessions. I want to mention it again because it's a short read. It's a short read. 
scholars believe this was written during the time of the apostles or the generation after that. In other words, it is an early document written either at the time of the apostles or the generation after that. In other words, it's an early manual that comes from either the first or second generation of believers. And this book is important. Let me explain why it's important. I don't know what this chadake mean. What do you mean chadake? Okay. It's important because this gives you an idea of how Christians practice their faith, how they pray, how they fasted, how they baptized, how they worshiped, how they lived. Now, I want you to remember two terms because here I, I don't want to bore you, but at the same time, I'm not here to entertain you. I want to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit to know your faith, know your faith deeply and have no doubt. May the Lord destroy every ounce of doubt we have and give us perfect faith in him to know he's God, he's real. Okay. Why is this an important document? I want you to remember two terms, orthodoxy and orthopraxy, orthopraxy. Orthodoxy means right doctrine. Correct teaching. Orthopraxy means right practice, correct practice, right? As Christians, God has given us a Bible to teach us correct doctrine and correct practice, correct living. The Didache is a manual showing you how the disciples of the apostles, those who knew the apostles and walked with them, lived the Christian faith, how they prayed, how they fasted, how they baptized, the vices they avoided, the virtues they cultivated and perfected. So you owe it to yourself to read this manual because in this manual, you'll be told that as part of your practice, as part of your daily worship of God, as part of your spiritual discipline, disciplining yourself to worship God, you need to recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day. That's in the manual. Do you know that? Now, why is this important, folks? This comes from the disciples of the apostles. So if the disciples of the apostles are telling you this is how Christians behave and live and worship, that means they would have received the approval of the apostles to do what they're doing. So this gives us a window into how the apostolic churches, the churches established by the apostles, would worship God and pray. So I encourage you guys, study it to see the vices, the sins that they warned against, the virtues that they asked you to perfect and cultivate, and how many times a day you should pray. And they said, pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Thank you, Rajan. God bless you. Are you with me there? Three times a day. In fact, did you know that the Didache is our oldest, earliest, oldest, earliest witness to how people were baptized did you know that the didache is our earliest oldest document coming from the disciples of the apostles those who knew the apostles and walked with them right how to baptize and you know how they baptized it's in the document i believe it's in chapter seven it's online for free okay you know how they baptize they said you must that baptize dip in running water find running water a lake pond you name it if you can't, then use just, you know, still water, you know, a, a pool of water. And if not, then you can sprinkle. But you have to dip them and then baptize them. And here it is. You just quoted it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and living water. Did you catch it? It's right there. You just posted it. First line just posted it. So this is our earliest source telling us that when they immerse someone in water, they would pronounce the Trinitarian formula. They would say, in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, not in the name of Jesus, contrary to these Unitarian heretics. But it says if you don't find running water, living water means running water, like a lake or a pond or whatever, then you can find a, a body of water, like in your bathtub if you have to, or your swimming pool now. But if you didn't even have that, then you'd sprinkle water three times over the person's head, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So this document shows us that the early church, the early church understood Matthew 28, 19 as the formula to use 
over the person being baptized. That when you baptize him, you say, in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. And this is a document that comes from the disciples of the apostles. Are you telling me they got it wrong? Are you with me there? You understand why everyone should read this manual? Let me repeat again. This is not just some manual written by some Joe Schmo. This is a manual written by the disciples of the apostles, the eyewitnesses of the apostles who saw the apostles, heard them preach, saw them do miracles, and commissioned them. This means that what you're reading is a way of life passed on by the apostles to their disciples. And in this manual, you're told fast Wednesday and Friday. And first and last, just cited it. Did you know that? Did you know that the early church, the church started by the apostles, the church overseen by the apostles, they would fast Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday and Friday. Did you know that? And in the manual, you're told to recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Yeah, Pedro, he just quoted it. First last, can you quote that section again? And thank our Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus, for modern technology. This is online for free. Thank you, Jesus saves us, Serene. God bless you, Azizi. May he bring more Serenes to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? She just posted it. First last. Did you see it? He posted Read it again. Okay? And let not your... Pastor, post one more time so we can read this. Let him post it again, and then we begin. And let not your fastings be with the hypocrites. Talking about the Jews who fast Monday and Thursday. Do not fast like the hypocrites, those Pharisees that Jesus called hypocrites. They fasted Monday and Thursday. For they fast on the second and the fifth day of the week. Second, that's Monday, and that's Thursday. But do you keep your fast on the fourth, Wednesday, and the preparation day, Friday? Did you see what it just said? You fast Wednesday and Friday, not like the hypocritical Pharisees. Monday and Thursday they fast. And now notice the rest. Neither pray ye as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, thus pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Three times in the day pray ye so. Did you catch it? Three times in the day pray ye so. Pray as the Lord Jesus taught you to pray. Our Lord's prayer, our Father, three times a day. So, folks, we do not pray enough. We don't fast enough. We don't obey the Lord enough. We need to exercise spiritually. And our spiritual exercise is prayer and fasting and reading and work. So the more we exercise spiritually, the stronger we become spiritually. We become spiritual behemoths. So follow this manual. Follow it. It comes from the apostles at least. If not from them, from their disciples. Follow their example. This is what the Christians were doing. See, now notice Abdullah Man. Did you catch what he just said? Look at Abdullah Man's response. He's in awe of how the disciples of the apostles of Jesus lived the Christian faith. He goes, wow, Christians are more religious. Wow, Christians are more religious. Did you catch it? He's even shocked at the discipline of our spiritual forebears. And folks, I need to pray a lot more. May God save me from my laziness. I need to fast a lot more. I need to discipline myself to train spiritually, my spiritual muscles. And you need to pray and fast and study the word and then meditate on the word because that is your spiritual exercise, your spiritual discipline, your spiritual way of life. Rebecca, let me try this again one more time. This manual comes from the disciples of the apostles. You just insulted them by saying, these are added traditions, though. You understand what you just did? You just insulted the men that knew the apostles because you know better than them. Now, Rebecca, because of that comment, I'm going to have to call you out. Can you show me where in the New Testament it tells you how many times to pray the Lord's Prayer, if at all? Did Jesus not tell you to pray that prayer? Can you show me where it says how many times to pray? Once a week, 
Once a day, once a month. Okay. This is an ignorant statement coming from a Protestant who thinks that all traditions are bad and there aren't traditions that are holy and honorable because they come from the apostles that are not written. Rebecca, can you show me where Hanukkah is in the Old Testament? Is Hanukkah in the Old Testament, the observance of Hanukkah? I'm going to now turn this criteria against you because you condemned our Lord and his followers with your statement. I'm very disappointed this came from your mouth. Can you show me where in the Old Testament scriptures that you accept God commanded the observance of Hanukkah? Rebecca. She, she doesn't accept the Apocrypha, Joanna. She's a Protestant. See, because that's a typical Protestant response. Because she thinks as a Protestant, all traditions are bad. And she doesn't even understand. Anyway, can you show me? Okay, Jesus didn't say a lot of things, Rebecca. He didn't say a lot of things. Don't avoid and tap dance. Can you show me where Jesus says, worship him on Sunday? Let's play your game, Rebecca. Because I don't think you're going to have a long history here. I'm sorry because of that comment. And your cowardice in responding directly. Can you show me where Jesus says, gather on Sunday and worship on Sunday? And how to worship on Sunday? Rebecca, let's play your game. Let's go with Jesus and just what's written. Let's go with that. Let's play your game. Where did Jesus say, where did Jesus say, Rebecca, observe church on Sunday and tells you how to do church when you gather on Sunday? Samuel Hartman. You're not talking to me, right? Because you're going to be thrown out of here as well. Sorry, guys. I have to clean house at times, even with people who should know better. It seems so lucky. Get her out of here. Don't come back, Rebecca. This is not for you. Get her out of here. Go somewhere else. I don't want people like this here. Get her out of here, guys, now. Thank you. Yeah. What an insult. I just said this comes from the disciples of the apostles, and then th she insults them by saying these are traditions. And, folks, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I'm glad this happened. Let me tell you something. Don't be stupid enough to assume all traditions are bad. Do not be that ignorant to assume if it's not written, it must be bad. The only time a tradition is to be rejected is if it contradicts the Bible. Let me repeat this again. If there's a tradition that contradicts the Bible, they, you, that you discard. But tradition in of itself is not bad because there are a lot of things that was passed on orally by the apostles. And Didache, if it's a manual by the disciples of the apostles, guess what that tells you? That what you're reading is some of the traditions that the apostles taught their disciples that's not written. Did you know that? You understand my point? I hope what she did got your attention. So here, let me play devil's advocate. So you're saying, let me see what you, let me bring out the implication of her, her assertion. So you're saying the disciples of the apostles went above and beyond the words of their Lord by demanding of Christians to say the Lord's Prayer three times. So you're saying that what they did was something not only it's not scriptural, but it actually is a tradition that's bad, that's an error, that's silly, like she said. She called it silly. So where were the apostles to check this? Where were the apostles to rebuke them? Where were the apostles to correct them? So it's silly to say the Lord's Prayer three times a day. It's silly to fast on Wednesday and Friday. Yeah, you're right. Anyway. And folks, what was my point in asking that question? Let me explain to you. If you're going to play the route that it's tradition, and if it's not in the Bible, it has to be completely rejected. And by the way, I believe in sola scriptura. You know what sola scriptura means? It does not mean there aren't traditions that you follow that are not in the Bible. Sola scriptura means the Bible is the ultimate authority. It's the standard to determine right or wrong. But Sola Scripture doesn't mean that you don't look into church fathers, church history, and it doesn't mean that if there's a tradition that's not 
spelled out in scripture, reject it. That's not what Sola Scriptura teaches. That's not what Sola Scriptura teaches. Okay. And the reason why I got offended, folks, I didn't get offended that she challenged me. I got offended because she insulted the disciples of the apostles. That's why I got offended. I got upset because this is now attacking the integrity and credibility of the apostles because it's one thing for a disciple of an apostle to get something wrong and the apostle rebuke him. But this is not a manual in which the disciples of those who followed the apostles are saying things that are unholy or bad or contradict scripture. Why would you call it silly? Why would you call it silly? You mean it's silly that the followers of the apostles fasted twice a week? It's silly that the disciples of the apostles try to honor the Lord Jesus Christ by doing what he said. When you pray, pray this way. So, Lord, we love you and we honor your word. So we're going to pray three times. And you know why three times? Let's see how many of you are wise here. Why did they do it three times? Why three times? Why not two? In honor of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Hafsa. Thank you, Pedro. And you're telling me they were not honoring to God? That's not honoring to God? To want to honor the triune God and love the triune God and worship the triune God and live more faithfully and more disciplined and say the Lord's Prayer three times and honor the Father, Son, and Spirit? That's, that's a tradition. That's silly. Shame on you. Don't ever come back to my challenge channel. Shame on you. Don't ever come back to my channel. Insulting these men of God and women of God. What an insult, right? It's attacking these men. You cannot hold a candlestick to these men. Let me tell you something about this manual, okay? When it was written. Let me tell you that when this was written at a time where to be a Christian, you could be killed, burned alive, or fed to the, to the lions in the arena. And you're saying this is silly. Men who shed their blood and died as martyrs for Jesus exhorting Christians to live a holy, disciplined life, and you say it's silly. Shame on you. I don't want someone like you here. Get out of here. And you wonder why I get angry. You wonder why I get angry and live it. All right? Let me now correct those of you who think sola scriptura means you don't look, you don't look to the church fathers or traditions. Sola scriptura does not mean there aren't truths outside the Bible preserved among the holy men and women of God who knew the apostles and their followers after them. Sola Scriptura says that if there's a tradition that contradicts the Bible, that is something you set aside. C Catholic Christy, it's one thing that she doesn't know. It's another thing to attack because of your ignorance. Catholic Christy. That was my problem because she goes, it seems like tradition and you mean questioning something silly. It's That was silly? I bet you she doesn't even fast once a week. And so it's silly to exhort Christians to fast Wednesday and Friday. That's silly. It's silly to say, honor the Lord by saying the Lord's Prayer and honor the Lord by praying it three times for each member of the Godhead. That's silly? That's silly. Now, honestly, tell me that's silly to say, I want you to honor Jesus and carry out his exhortation to say this prayer, but do it three times in honor of the Trinity. That's silly? Or is that showing you a deep love and reverence for the Godhead? Sorry, guys. Guys, I don't want to offend you, and I don't want to cause you to stumble. But when it comes to the things of the faith, don't expect me to be passive because that was an insult to the apostles and their followers and an insult to our Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus didn't know what he was doing when he appointed apostles and they didn't know what they were doing when they appointed their successors because they botched up so bad so early so that she should become a Jehovah's Witness and Mormon because that's the Jehovah's Witness and Mormon argument. Did you know that, folks? It's the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons who say, that the Christians were such a bunch of incompetent fools that by the time John died, the true church disappeared. So Jesus had to show up in the 1800s and recommit or commission Joseph Smith to restore the church. 
You know, this argument will lead you to a heresy because that's the argument of the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons. You know what Jehovah's Witnesses Mormons will say? Don't take my word for it. They'll say, by the time of the second century, when John died, the church apostatized. They're a bunch of incompetent fools who corrupted the message so early that God had to wait for about 1,700 years later in the 19th century to either rise up Charles Taze Russell or Joseph Smith to restore the church that had been lost. That's what they believe. But how different are you from them when you say that such an early document that comes from the lifetime of the apostles, oh, that's so silly. Oh, look at all those traditions. So at least the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons say it took place in the second century. But you're saying the corruption took place in the lifetime of the apostles and they could do nothing to prevent the church from being so corrupt so early. We have a basis in scripture. When Christians got out of line, the apostles rebuked them. In, in Corinthians, Paul, Paul is rebuking carnal Christians who are messing up the, the order of worship. In Revelation, five of the seven churches are about to apostatize, and John is warning them. Where is any warning about the Didache? Exactly, Daryl Nutt. Ecclesia ni Cristo believe that about Felix Manello. Telling me it's silly. Shame on you. Thank the Lord Jesus I'm supposed to constrain myself. Because if I wasn't, and I'm being honest, forgive me, I'm human. When someone attacks my Lord or his followers, right? Man, God constrain me and crucify my flesh. In Jesus' name. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Purify my motives because I'm corrupted too. And forgive us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, have mercy on us, Lord. And save me from unrighteous anger. That my anger will be righteous and holy for your glory. All right, are we now ready that we got rid of this nonsense? Okay. And I don't mean to yell at you guys. You're not kids. And you don't have to be here. You're coming here because you're trusting the Lord's going to use me to bless you. But all I'm letting you know, all I'm letting you know, don't be stupid to think that because something's not in the Bible, that means it's a silly tradition. That is stupidity. That's naivete. Because here, I'm going to play that game. I'm going to play that game. Show me in the New Testament. Where you're told to gather on Sunday, and when you gather, how to conduct your worship service. Show me that. God bless you, Edison. Show me that. Okay. So according to her logic, that's a tradition. Why would you impose on the church from early on to gather on Sunday? Or to observe the Lord's Supper when you gather. That's a tradition. It's, it's, it's so silly. Okay. For those of you who don't accept the Apocrypha, even if you accept the Apocrypha, even if you accept the Apocrypha, can you show me anywhere in the Old Testament or the Apocrypha, the Jewish writings, First and Second Maccabees, where God commissioned observing Hanukkah? Can you show me that? Luis, I hope you guys are listening. I hope I didn't cause you to stumble. And being angry, and I hope my anger was righteous for the glory of Christ and not for the praise of men. Can you show me in any Old Testament book, even the Apocrypha, where God says, from now on, one of your holy days, one of your feasts is Hanukkah? Can anyone show me that? Hanukkah. Anyone? Can anyone show me? Come on, help me out. Anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, even the apocryphal books that Catholics, Orthodox accept as part of the Hebrew Bible, where it says, my people will observe Hanukkah. That's one of the holy feasts. Even in the intertestamental literature of Bill Thompson, because those books are accepted by Catholics and Orthodox as scripture. Do you find anywhere in Maccabees that says this celebration is ordained by God and has to be observed? No, let me let me cut to the chase. No, nowhere. But guess what? Jesus observed it in John 10, 22. John 10, 22, we are told that our Lord, Jesus, went to Jerusalem in the winter to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. Guess what Hanukkah means? Dedication. Jesus observed Hanukkah. And notice John says it took place in the winter exactly when Hanukkah takes place. Jesus, why are you observing Hanukkah? 
It's not commissioned by God. It's a silly tradition, Jesus. See how stupid that is? Does something have to be in Scripture for it to be pleasing to God, acceptable to God, ordained by God? As long as it doesn't contradict Scripture, and as long as ba it's based on what the Scriptures teach as a whole. Remember I said that yesterday? Not everything in the Bible is black and white, but you have to study the Scriptures as a whole and carefully by the grace of the Spirit and draw correct inferences and come to correct conclusions. Right? Another thing. Did Jesus... Go to synagogue on Sabbath? Did Jesus observe synagogue worship on the Sabbath? Did he go to the Sabbath on, uh, I'm sorry, synagogue on Sabbath? Yeah, he did. Now I'm going to challenge every one of you, you sola scripturists, and I'm sola scripturist too. Show me in the Old Testament where it says you Jews must gather in a place of worship called the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Show it to me. Where did God commission this? Where did God commission? Gathering together in a place called the synagogue to observe Sabbath. So why did Jesus honor this tradition that arose when the Jews return from Babylonian captivity, it's not in the Old Testament. That's the point, Panos Filippo. It's not in the Old Testament. This was a tradition that arose among the Jews when they returned from Babylon. And Jesus is amening that tradition. He's observing that tradition. He's not condemning that tradition. Are you with me there? I have no idea what Jeremy's talking about. I'm in I'm in Wrigley Field. He's in Comiskey Park. Are you with me there? Because sacrifices were ordained by God in the Old Testament. So I don't know what he's talking about. The book of Leviticus is all about sacrifices. So what did you learn from these few examples that I gave you? What did you learn from these examples? Not all tradition is bad. Not all tradition is to be rejected. Many good traditions that God blesses and approves of that are not in Scripture as long as it doesn't contradict Scripture. You want me there? You understand now my zeal and my passion and my anger for that comment that this came out of the mouth of this young sister, which I expected better from her, but she's poisoned by... You know, because listen, every major branch of Christianity has traditions that have poisoned them and affected them and blinded them. We Protestants have many traditions. It's not just the Catholics and the Orthodox. Many traditions that blind us from being open and receptive to finding truth in all these traditions by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. You in there? Now that I got that out of sight, can we now focus? Let me repeat my advice to every one of you. You owe it to yourself and to your spiritual forebears in honor of Jesus and the apostles to read the Didache. And after you read the Didache, show me what is wrong with anything written there. Exactly, Louisa Campbell. They're going above and beyond what is written. Right? I want you to take my challenge. Didache is a small manual. You can finish it in an hour. Thank you, Rebel Mark. God bless you. Go and read it. And come back to me and tell me you found something that was so untrue and so ridiculous and so silly and contradicted scripture. I challenge you to do that. Can you take me up on the challenge? Show me anything in that book that contradicts scripture and is not praiseworthy to observe as an act of sacrifice and devotion and discipline to the triune God. Can you do that for me? Can you do that for me? And, and first and last gave you. And you can find translations of the decay in more modern English, modernized English. So do that for me. And I'm sorry for that distraction. I apologize. I, again, I don't want to offend you, but I'm not going to tickle your ear, especially when you make comments like that. Shame on you for disrespecting these holy men and women of God. Now, if there was something that contradicts Scripture or commanding to vice, then, yeah, rebuke it. Because the apostles rebuke churches when they're corrupting themselves. 
But what is there in that book that is blameworthy, worthy of condemnation? Show it to me. You won't find it. Show it to me. You won't find it. It's praiseworthy. Let alone that it comes from the lifetime of the apostles. Because some will tell you it's written around the time of the apostles, before 70 AD. Others will push it a little later. But still, it's early enough that it comes from either the eyewitnesses of the apostles or the disciples of the eyewitnesses of the apostles. And what bothers me even worse, Michael, is people know the book and in their ignorance and arrogance condemn tradition because it's not found in the book. That bothers me even more. Now, that's it. Are we ready now to focus? Are we ready now to talk about prayers? This was unnecessary. Again, I trust Holy Spirit guided this because I always ask Holy Spirit, take over the sessions, take over my mouth and guide me in accord with your will. And I actually am very calm and at peace for what I did. And I trust that's because the spirit. I trust. I'm not a prophet. I can't say absolutely. I trust that was from the spirit because I, I'm at peace and have a sense of calmness. What I did was necessary so that you guys can learn. All right? So you guys can learn. And I, I affirm sola scriptura. I am a sola scripturist. The Bible's the ultimate authority. But it doesn't mean that means nothing. If it's not found in the Bible, no, man, that doesn't work like that. Come on, be serious. Now, with that said, let's talk about prayers to Jesus. This was a necessary, necessary, quote unquote, distraction. Necessary because I do sense peace and calmness, and I trust that's from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, these are your sessions for the glory of Jesus. Take over these sessions and consume our flesh and fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. And have mercy on those who in ignorance say something stupid and insulting. Have mercy. Forgive us in Jesus' name. <sighs> yeah, Allah. Oof, man. You, you see why I want to become an IT guy? Yes, Abdullah Aman. I did a session yesterday, Abdullah, on Jesus commanding people to pray to him. Abdullah Aman. So you need to do me a favor, Abdullah Aman. Listen to yesterday's session, part one. Um, I gave verses where... Where Jesus commands people to pray to him and the Hawadiyun, his disciples, pray to him. And I'm going to give further examples. Okay, I'm going to give further examples. In fact, for the sake of Abdullah Aman, let me answer the question for him. Okay, Abdullah Aman, according to the Quran, guys, I'm going to kill two birds, one stone. And by the way, Abdullah, after this session, why don't I, why don't I do this? After this session, Abdullah, Lord willing, in another hour after I'm done, I'm doing a session on how Muhammad proved Jesus is God. And it's going to be about prayers, dua. Can you wait for that session and show up for that session? Or do you want me to do it now? Amen. Praise Holy Spirit. Because right now it's 1 o'clock my time. I'm going to finish this session in, an, in another 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then I'm going to start right away half an hour after this session ends. Lord Jesus willing, by the grace of God. Unless you want me to do it right now. It's up to you, Abdullah, because you are my guest, and I want to make sure the Spirit is using me to show you the truth. You want me to do it now? Guys, let's let's be courteous to our guest because we're praying that he comes to know Jesus Christ and falls in love with it. Okay, let's do it now. All right. Okay, Abdullah. People want me to do it for your sake because look how much they love you. See, he said now. All right. Look how much they love you. They go, do it now. Do it now. All right, let's do it now. Let's go to chapter 40, verse 60 of the Quran. Chapter 40, verse 60 of the Quran. We're going to have to retitle the session then. All right. Chapter 40, verse 60 of the Quran. Panus Filippo. Filippo. Now, guys, if you want me to help Abdullah, if you want me to help Abdullah, can you help me? And don't put too many texts because he's going to get lost in the texting. I want him to focus on the verses. Yes, do what Catholic Christie did. Now pray for him. But now... Can you do me a favor? Because too many texting, he's not going to be able to follow the text. Can we now, out of love for Abdullah, to see him come to the to Christ, no texting right now. Stop. Stop. No more texting. Okay, Abdullah. Yeah, hold your fingers and he texts anyway. I love you, TM. All right. Abdullah, it's all for you now because of Jesus' love for you. Because Jesus loves you, he's making us love you in return and serve you. 40 verse 60 of the Quran. 
40 verse 60 of the Quran. 40 verse 60 of the Quran. Okay, read with me. And your Lord has said, pray unto me and I will hear your prayer. Lo, those who scorn my service, they will enter hell disgrace. Now the word prayer is dua. Abdullah, the Arabic is dua. It actually means call unto me. So now first last, find a translation other than Pikthal where it says call unto me. Because technically the word for prayer is, uh, is salah, salah, right? Salawat, plural. Here it's not. It's Dua. Now notice this. Notice this, Abdullah, what your Quran says. And your Lord says, call upon me, call upon me, I will respond to you. Indeed, those who disdain my worship will enter hell, rendered contemptible. So here the Quran says, you call on your Lord, Allah, and that's your act of worship. If you don't call on Allah, that means you refuse to worship him, then you are contemptible and off to hell you go. Chapter 40, verse 65. Chapter 40, verse 65. Chapter 40, verse 65. He is the living one. Okay, now, Abdullah. Notice it says, Allah is the living one. There is no Allah save him. So pray unto him. There you go again with the Pictal translation. Astaghfirullah Rabbil Alameen. Audhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. He is the living, the living one. There is no God but he. Therefore, call on him. Call on him. Okay? It's not salah. It's not salawat. It's dua, meaning to call. Obviously, you call on Allah in prayer. But pay attention. I want you to pay attention, Abdullah. You call on Allah. He's the living one, right? Being sincere to him in obedience. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So now, Abdullah, pay attention to what the Quran says. You call on Allah, that's your act of worship, right? And he is the living one. Let me show you what Jesus says in John 14, 13 and 14. John 14, 13 and 14. John 14, 13 and 14. Watch here. For Abdullah. Yeah, I'm going to have to do another session. I'm going to make this one on Muhammad, I guess. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, Abdullah, did you see what Jesus just said? Ask in my name. Make your dua to me in my name. I will answer your dua. I will answer your invocation. Ask in my name and I will do it. Are you catching that, Abdullah, what Jesus just said? Who's going to answer the dua? Who's going to answer the dua here? Jesus, God's son, right? And when is he going to answer it? When he goes to heaven. How do I know? Because in John 14, 12, he says it. I'm going to my father. So Abdullah, can someone other than Allah in heaven, someone other than Allah in heaven, answer the dua of the worshipers on earth? Can someone... Other than Allah in heaven, answer prayers, the dua of the worshipers on, on earth. Or is this something only God can do, only Allah can do? Only see? So now, can you explain to me why Jesus, if he's a Muslim, is saying, when I go to the Father, ask in my name, I will answer your dua from heaven. I will answer your dua. Yeah, if you ask Jesus, he'll burn your filthy prophet in hell. And his mother as well. So what does this tell you? Is Jesus claiming to be a servant or is he claiming to be God? Because he does what only God can do. Answer the dua of the worshipers on earth. Who is Jesus claiming to be? Abdullah. Okay, guys. You hear what an honest Muslim just said? No comment. Don't text. But rejoice in your heart. Pray for him. He just admit. Jesus claim divinity. Jesus claim divinity because he sees Jesus claiming to be God. Okay. Now let me show you another one. Acts 7, 55 to 60. Acts 7, 55 to 60. The first shaheed, 
the first martyr who died for Jesus. He got stoned. Rajim, they stoned him because he said Jesus is the son of God, the son of man who rules in heaven. Notice, Acts 7, 55 to 60. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So notice, notice Abdullah, Stephen, the first shaheed, right? He's, he's, a, he's a tabi. He's a disciple of the Sahaba, of Isa, of Jesus. He is a follower of the disciples of Jesus. Heaven opens. Heaven opens. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows him to see heaven. And in heaven, he sees Jesus standing at the right side of God by the arsh, by the kursi, the throne of God. Okay, that's what you just read. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open. The Son of Man, because Jesus is still a man. He's truly human. He became a human being from his blessed mother, and he's human in heaven, standing on the right hand of God. But now watch what happens. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Because to them that was kufr. They thought it's kufr to say that. It's blasphemy, unbelief to say that. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now notice this, verse 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, dua, this is dua, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua, my Lord Jesus, I'm about to die. I give my spirit to you. Take my spirit to you. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Rab. He's calling Jesus Rab. Lay not this sin to their charge. Lord, don't punish them for their sin. Forgive them for their sin of what they did to me. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So now let me ask you a question, Abdullah. Stephen is a tabi. He's a disciple of the Sahaba of Jesus. He's a disciple of the followers of Jesus who knew Jesus, who met Jesus. And he sees heaven open, the Holy Spirit, Ruhul Qudus, allows him to see heaven. He sees Jesus in his physical body, because he's still a man, standing at the right hand of God the Father, by the kursi, by the arsh, by the throne of God. And he says, look, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And as he's about to die, he says, Rab Yesuh, Rabbi Yesuh, my Lord Jesus, receive my spirit and Lord Forgive them. Don't punish them for their sin. Okay, now, Abdullah, is this dua? Is he making dua here, Stephen? And is he a shaheed, a martyr who's dying for the cause of Allah? Right? This is dua, right? Okay. Can you explain to me why is he making dua to Jesus? Why is he calling Jesus a rab when the Quran says you have only one rab? You have only one rab. Yeah, well, like when you talk to your mother, an imaginary dog that birthed you. Talk to one Rab in heaven. That's he, that's God. But he says, Rab, Jesus. And then he tells Jesus, take my spirit, my ruh, my, my nafs, nafsi into your hands. Take me into your presence. And then he says, Jesus, Rab, Lord, forgive them. According to the Quran, only God is Rab in heaven. According to the Quran, only God forgives sins. And according to the Quran, only God hears your dua and you are to call on him. Yet Stephen, a tabi, who was a follower of the apostles of Jesus, looks and sees Jesus by the kursi, the throne of God, in his human body as a man who's more than a man. And he calls him Rab and he makes his dua to him and he trusts his nafs, his soul and ruh to him and asks him to forgive those who kill him. You see the shock on Abdullah? Did you catch it? You see what he just said? I didn't know Jesus' disciples called them Rab and made dua. You guys see it? Here again, God is blessing you Christians. Why? Not only are you seeing the Holy Spirit shake this man's foundation, opening his heart to see the truth of Jesus, but you're now seeing how powerful these passages are and proving that Jesus is the God-man. Are you guys seeing it? 
Now, don't comment yet. Abdullah, did I give you enough, enough proof for now? And I'll give you more proof in the next session because I'm going to go over these verses again. In the next session, I'll give you more proof. I just gave you a test, a, ta a taste of what's to come. So is that enough for now? That you saw Jesus said, make your dua to me. And they made their dua to Jesus and called Jesus Rabb while he's in heaven and gave their soul to Jesus, their spirit to Jesus when they died. Something you only do to God, right? Only God is Rabb in heaven. Only God hears your dua, your invocation. Only God receives your spirit when you die. When you die, your spirit goes to God. And only God can forgive sins. D guys, frame this. Thou shalt not pontificate. See what he just said? Then why do Muslim apologists use the Bible? They are very educated. Guys, save that as a testimony. Here's a man whom the Holy Spirit is opening his eyes to see the Bible shouts, Jesus is God and God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now you can, you can comment now, guys. Go ahead. You're free to comment. You're free to comment. Now, for the Christians, are you seeing how powerful these passages are? Are you seeing how clear the evidence is that Jesus is the God-man and he's to be worshipped as God and prayed to as God and that God is the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Spirit? They're not one person. They're three persons, one God. Are you seeing it now with your eyes as the Lord is blessing you to bring you people who are not Christian, not from a Christian background, but are seeing it and are like, wow. It is clear that they're worshiping Jesus as God. And yet you have Satanists, children of the devil, claiming to be Christian like Unitarians, who read these passages and deny the clear teaching of these passages. Thank you, Basirat. Thank you. Right? So everyone with me? Louisa, Renee, Anna Groin. I don't know if Nada's here. Magdalene, are all you guys here? The sisters here with the brothers? Following it, understanding, being blessed, being challenged, being convicted, being stretched by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ? And thou should not pontificate. Our dear friend. Is our friend following along? Okay. With that said, let's talk about some other prayers offered to our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we ready? One thing you're going to see as an indication as an indication that the New Testament writers treat the Father, Son, and Spirit as equal divine persons. And I want you to hear me here. That the New Testament treats the Father, Son, and Spirit as being equal in their dignity, their honor, their worship, their glory, and their nature. They're not the same person. Three eternal relationships, three persons in love with one another, in communion with one another, in fellowship with one another, and inseparable from one another. Three persons, one God. One way you'll see how the New Testament identifies them as being equal in essence, in glory and dignity is the fact that when prayers are offered to them, they don't follow a set order. They don't follow a set order. Now, what do I mean? I'm going to show you examples in which Paul will start his prayer by putting Jesus ahead of the Father. Another place he'll start his prayer by mentioning the Father ahead of the Son. They don't follow any set order where they start with the Father, go to the Son, go to the Spirit. Sometimes it's they mention Jesus first, then the Father. Sometimes the Father, then Jesus. Sometimes just Jesus alone. They don't follow a set pattern. And it would be utter blasphemy, utter blasphemy to mention a creature in your prayer, especially mentioning a creature ahead of God, where I call on a creature, then I call to God. That is blasphemy, right? Let me give you an example. If I say, oh, Gabriel and God the Father, guide us to yourself, that would be blasphemy. Catholics Orthodox would agree. That is blasphemy, man. What do you mean, oh, Gabriel and God the Father? As if Gabriel is equal to God, right, and works in tangent with God to bring about God's will. Because in Catholic tradition, in Orthodox tradition, they don't believe the angels and the saints answer prayer. They believe angels and saints pray for you. So let me explain to you what the tradition teaches. Because a lot of people think that when they pray to Mary, they're asking Mary. To, no, no. They're praying to Mary to petition Christ to answer your prayer. 
Are you with me there? So even if you reject this doctrine, if you reject it, represent it correctly. No informed Catholic or Orthodox or Coptic believes that Mary answers prayers if they understand their tradition. What they believe is when they say, Mary, help us, Mary, sa save us, that's shorthand for Blessed Mother of my Lord Jesus, petition Jesus, ask Jesus to answer my prayer. That's what they mean. No, Miron, they don't in the sense in which you think. See, here, Joanna, she's a Catholic. Notice what she said. Mary is praying, not answering. You may reject it, Miron. You may not accept it. That's fine. But I accurately represent what they believe. All right? Accurately. So even a Catholic would agree. You never say, Gabriel and God answer. Because you're grouping Gabriel with God as having the same ability as God to answer the prayer. You No. This is condemned in Catholic tradition, Orthodox tradition, Coptic tradition, and Protestants. Blue bubble, it's okay, blue bubble. The Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son, there are passages in which they are called what, which, and it. As long as you don't take that to mean that they're not divine persons in perfect, inseparable, eternal fellowship. Is that clear to everyone? Am I making sense? Daily light. If those Catholics do pray to Mary, they're going against their own tradition, and even a Catholic would correct them and rebuke them and discipline them if they are faithful to their tradition. There are abuses in every tradition, daily light. There are also abuses in Protestant traditions, even in Protestant traditions. So an abuse doesn't mean something is wrong, something is right. An abuse means that you need to correct it, right? You get my point? We don't then become reactionary and go to the extreme opposite end, right? Because that's what happens among Christians. If you got a group that are fanatical and fanatically wrong and have taken something to the extreme, in response, we go to the exact opposite extreme instead of finding the middle balanced position that's biblical. Okay, you get what I'm saying? So here's the Roman Catholic telling you, don't pray to Mary. It's blasphemous. Ask Mary. Okay, now, what that said, put that aside. This is not a debate about communion of saints. I did sessions on that. What I was trying to say is, not even those who believe in communion of saints would say, oh, Gabriel and God, guide us to yourself. Oh, Archangel Michael and God the Father, guide us. No. Oh, Raphael and Jehovah, bless us. They wouldn't pray that. Right? Because that's a creature. He doesn't bless. He asks God to bless you. He doesn't bless. He asks God to bless you. Now, why am I saying this? Are you ready now why I went into this? What seemed to be a distraction, and it's not, because I want to show you what the New Testament does when they pray to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Watch. Watch this, guys. Watch. Are you ready now? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. Watch here. They don't even call on Mark, Michael the Archangel Magnificent. They say you pray to the Father alone in Jesus' name. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. Watch here. Now God himself and our Father and our Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Did you catch it? Who is he praying to? Who is Paul praying to? To guide the Apostle Paul and his companions to the church in Thessalonica. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. We ask the Father and Jesus to make our journey to you successful and give us the grace to reach you and see you face to face. No, Paul doesn't say pray to Jesus because he's our high priest. No, you're talking about the one meteor passage. That's a different section. That's a different passage, not relevant to the point I'm making. You, you see that, guys? 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. We'll read it one more time. I don't think you caught it. Focus now. Here's what I want you to focus on, prayers. Here's a prayer to the Father and the Son, invoking the Father and the Son to do something together in unison equally. 1 Thessalonians, 4, verse 11, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. Come on, Protestant, before the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11. 
Okay. Now God himself and our Father, who's our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Okay, did you guys see it? Paul, why are you praying to the Father and the Son to do this action? Why are you saying Father and Son? We pray that you together will gu guide us and bring us to the church in Thessalonica safely, free of harm. Why are you invoking Jesus with the Father to perform this action, Paul? Are you seeing that prayer? Do you see the prayer now? He's praying to two, the Father and the Son together. And he assumes that Jesus is equally involved in answering the prayer to the same extent that the Father is. Like the Father who answers, the Son answers as well. They answer together in union. Hey, Esther, how are you? Everyone with me there? He's praying to the Father and the Son. But now notice how he changes his prayer. Are you ready now for him to change the object of his prayer? In verses 12 to 13. Verses 12 to 13. Watch here now. He started with the Father and Jesus Christ. Now notice 12 and 13. Guys, I really need to know if you're paying attention. Because if you don't get this, you're missing out. Goal. Notice now. He started with saying God the Father and Jesus Christ, but now he prays to Jesus. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he, the Lord, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, well, the saints. You see what he just did? In midstream of his prayer, he invokes God the Father and Jesus. Then he turns his attention to the Lord Jesus. And he says, the Lord Jesus, keep you unblameable, keep you blameless, keep you holy in the sight of God our Father until our Lord Jesus comes with his saints. Wow. What are you doing, Paul? You start your prayer by invoking the Father and the Son. Then you invoke the Son. And then you attribute to the Son an ability that only God has. Because notice what he said. It is the Son who will keep believers blameless. It is the Son who preserves us from sin. It is the Son who makes me holy and pleasing in the sight of God. And it's the Son who preserves me holy until he returns. Now, can I ask you a question? Let me ask you a question. What kind of attributes must Jesus have in order to be able to preserve all believers, make them holy, make them blameless, save them from sin, saving them from being consumed by sin, making them good enough to stand in the presence of God and keep them saved and pure till he returns. What kind of attributes must he have? Now, folks, are you blown away with how he's praying? He starts with God the Father and Jesus. Then he transitions to Jesus, mentions Jesus, and he concludes his prayer prayer to Jesus. You see what's happening here? What I said yesterday. Luis and everyone else, you remember what I said yesterday? You can start your prayer by directing the Father and then transition to the Son and transition to the Spirit. Or you can start your prayer by mentioning the Son and just pray to Him or then transition to the Father and the Spirit. As long as you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and say, Holy Spirit, I beg you, take over my prayer and teach me how to pray the prayers that delight my God. Shabazz, go listen to my session yesterday. Don't ask me a question I heard just yesterday. Okay, now, now let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now get ready to be blown away. Well, you, you've been blown away anyway, but 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Watch here. Watch this one. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us. Did you see? He starts with Jesus and he puts Jesus ahead of God. Whoa. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. Here's another prayer. But notice he mentions Jesus first. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Paul, what did you just do here? You started with Jesus first and then the Father in your prayer. Did you catch? I don't know if it, I'm going to give you a minute for it to sink in. You guys seeing it or no? Sorry. 
You guys seen it or no? 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. One more time. Do you see how rich and deep the Bible is in affirming the Trinity and that you are to worship the Trinity and glorify the Trinity and love the Trinity and adore the Trinity and invoke the Trinity? Notice again. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish in every good word and work. Yeah, no, actually you are the dark pig. And your mother is the dark dog. How about that, buddy? Okay. Everyone there? Oh, whoo. Poor dogs. Dogs are clean. Everyone there, you got it? Sink it in. Before I move on, I want to give you a minute for this to register. In one place, he starts with God the Father and Jesus Christ. And then he transitions to Jesus and ends a prayer. By invoking Jesus. In another place, Paul starts with Jesus and the, then the Father. He mentioned Jesus first, then the Father. Paul could only do this, mentioning Jesus first, if he thought Jesus is God Almighty, equal to the Father in glory, essence, dignity, and worship. Otherwise, he'd be blaspheming and doing something and ascribing something to a creature that belongs only to God. Right? But it's even more, more mind-boggling than that. It's even more mind-boggling than that. Something you don't see in the English as clearly. You know those verbs, those action verbs? Let me give you the link. Let me give you the link. Those action verbs that you just read? Comfort us and guide us and love us? Let me show you something so you don't take my word for it. Hold on. Because I know you're a bunch of skeptics. Okay, watch here. Here, go to the interlinear, and I want you to see something. I don't want you to take my word for it. And this is baffled scholars. Scholars actually are baffled by this, right? Now, when you click on it, I want you to see where it says, himself now, the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, and God, the Father of us, the one having loved us. If you actually look at the word for love, Look at the bottom. You'll see it says V-A-P-A-N-M-S. The word S there is singular. It's a singular verb. And then when it says given us, look at it. It's S, singular verb. Loved, singular verb. Given, singular verb, right? Singular. All throughout this prayer, Paul is using the singular verbs. Even though he's praying to two, he says, Now the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, he who has loved us, he who has given us comfort, may he establish us in every good deed and word. Folks, why is he using the singular verb when he's speaking to two persons? He's praying to two persons. He's not saying, may the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, they who loved us. It's may the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, he who loved us, he who has given us comfort, May he establish us in every good deed and word. Why is that? Why is that? Why is he using the singular verbs? Why is he describing the love, the giving of comfort, the establishing, those verbs, which are verbs of action, action verbs, why is he using them in the singular when he's praying to two? Thank you. You guys got it. Because though the Father and the Son are different persons, they are one God and their actions are one. See, when the Father acts, the Son acts, the Spirit acts. So you can describe the actions of the three as a single act performed by all three. Catholic Christy, don't get Augustinian on me. That's an Augustinian statement that almost depersonalizes the Holy Spirit. Keep your August, Augustine to yourself, brother. Focus on scripture. Okay? Are you with me there? It's getting too Augustinian. I'm trying to impress me with Augustine. All right. Are you with me there? You understand what I just said? Luisa, if you read the verse, it says, He who loved us, he who gave us comfort, may he establish 
you in every good deed and and word. The verbs are singular, but he's praying to two. He's praying to Jesus and God the Father. Why is he using singular verbs in his prayer for what the Father and the Son are doing together? Why singular? Why singular? What's the answer again? Why singular, folks? Come on, I want to see if you got it. We're almost done with this session. And I'm going to prepare for the second session. Not because they're the same person. The Father's not the Son. They're different persons. But because they're one God. You got it. They're one God. And so the action of the Father is the action of the Son is the action of the Spirit. When one acts, the other acts. So you can describe the love of the Father and the Son as His love to denote the fact that though they're not one person, they're still one God who do all things in perfect unity. Their actions are united. Their actions are one. And you're telling me the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity or to worship the Trinity? You got it there? Guys, can I ask, are you blown away with this? It's okay. I'm glad, Luisa, as long as you're getting it. Oh, good. Dad, you just answered me. I was going to say, are you blown away with this? And here, confirmation, mind blown again. So now you have the definitive answer. We pray to the Trinity. Well, as long as Magdalene, you're praying, the Holy Spirit keeps filling me with wisdom and knowledge and depth, we will, we will con constantly be blown away because it has to be from the Spirit, the depth of knowledge. Otherwise, I can't do this. I'm not qualified. I depend on Him and need Him. We all need the Holy Spirit. He's the Almighty God. Okay, now, let me now explain something else. Because we're going to end it with another example of a prayer. But I need to break this down. Let's go to Revelation. It's going to take a while. All right, Revelation 5, 6. And then we're going to do another session after this. Thank you, Ulf Tormit. The only doctrine you can derive from the Bible is the Trinity, if you're honest to the Bible. Exactly, Josh, one God. Amen. All right, now, Revelation 5, 6. Here again. Yeah, now, Lisa, if you're out of your love for Jesus, pray for me. Holy Spirit, keep soaking this man in wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and depth, and love, and purity, and worship, and holiness, and faith, and trust. Because the more he fills me, the more I'll bless you. Well, I got a few focus coming up. Okay, Revelation 5, verse 6. I got to break this down for you guys to understand the Trinitarian prayer. Revelation 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. One more time. You understand the prayer. Bet I don't care to know your name. How about that? You're not that important for me to know your name. Revelation 5, verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the world. Now, here's where I really need you to tell you, pay attention. Catholic Christie, you're going to have a short lifespan on my channel. No one said the Holy Spirit is not a him, but the Holy Spirit is also called in it, as the Father and the Son are called it. The neuter pronoun is irrelevant in establishing the personhood of the members of the Godhead. Stop chiming in. You're not going to last here if you keep doing it and distracting. This is now your second warning. Don't get Augustinian on me and don't get grammatical on me. Sit back and listen and enjoy. So you don't distract me to distract the brothers and sisters who are listening. Okay? God bless you, basic. Okay, guys, let me break down the imagery. We know that Jesus isn't isn't literally a lamb, and Jesus doesn't literally have seven eyes and doesn't literally have seven horns. What John is giving us is an image that he saw. Pay attention now. An image that he saw where Jesus is appearing in that way. Jesus is appearing as a young male lamb with the throat slit slain but alive with seven horns and seven eyes in order to teach John <clears throat> some deeper spiritual truths. Are you ready? Do you want me to now unpack what the significance, send Kai out of here, send Kai to his mother, the beast. The significance of Jesus appearing as a young lamb 
what seven horns and seven eyes are, which are the seven spirits. Are we ready? You want to go a little bit more deep, a little more meat? Why is Jesus appearing as a young male lamb with the throat slit, but still alive with seven horns and seven eyes? Because these are symbols. These symbols are pointing to greater spiritual realities. Okay? Guys, get rid of it. You see all these fil filthy, wicked dogs of the devil? These demons are manifesting. The Lord Jesus rebuked them, keep them away. He's notice how many? Okay, now let's break it down. Number one, Jesus appears as a young male lamb. Young male lamb and the throat slit. Why do I say throat slit? Because notice what John said. I looked like, I looked to see what appeared as a lamb that had been slain. Historically, the way the Jews would sl slay lambs was to sl uh, slit their throat. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue. Slit their throat and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Lord. But though his throat was slit, he's still alive. And he appears as a young male lamb. Because the Greek word there is arnion. Arnion. The Greek word is arnion. No, Ibn Khan. Don't get yourself confused. That's a different Greek word in John 129. That's amnos. And I'm going by memory and I'm pretty certain I'm right. Okay. Now, Listen. Why is Jesus appearing as a young male lamb slain? Because he's showing himself as the Passover lamb. In Exodus 12, you can read it at your own leisure. God told the Israelites, take a young one-year-old male lamb and slay it. Eat the flesh. Don't break any of its bones. Take the blood. Mix it in with bitter herbs and hyssop and put the blood on top and the sides of the door and death will pass you over. So Jesus is appearing as the Passover lamb. The young male lamb, our Passover. That's the first symbolism, part of the symbolism. Why are you appearing as a lamb? Because that image conveys to us, he's our Passover lamb, and our Passover lamb has been slain. Now, why is that significant? Because when a Passover lamb is slain, that means a new exodus begins. That means the New Testament is unveiling the story of a new exodus, of a new people of God, spiritual Israel, that's being taken out of a new Egypt from the oppression of a new Pharaoh with a new Moses, a lawgiver, and a new covenant, and a new Joshua bringing us into the promised land. That's the story. There is no direct connection between the two daily light. Sabbath and Pat, they're not. So don't connect the two. They're not relevant right now. That's number one. No, not Exodus from sin. No, it's not Exodus from sin because the Passover lamb did not expiate for sin. The Passover lamb redeemed you from bondage. Yes, in a way, bondage from sin, bondage from Satan, bondage from the world. So yes and no, it's not expiation for sin, atonement for sin. It's the ransoming, the releasing from captivity. It's the ransoming and the releasing from bondage. Because when the Passover lamb had been slain, that's when Pharaoh released the Israelites from bondage. So the slaying of the Passover signifies being freed from bondage, being released from captivity. In this context, Jesus is releasing us from bondage to Satan, to this world, and to sin. Clear? Thank you. Yep, exactly, Justin. So yes and no. Exodus for sin in that it doesn't atone for sin, but it releases you from the bondage to sin and Satan and this fallen world. Did you get the first point of the imagery? Why is Jesus appearing as a young male lamb? That's why. That's symbolic of him being the Passover lamb. Did you get that? I don't know what you mean, Jesus is our Passover lamb. What do you mean the straw that broke the camel's back? Guys, focus. Okay, why seven horns? Why seven horns on his head? Number one, the term seven, the number seven, can, but not always. Let me repeat myself because I'm going to sound like a broken record. The number seven can, but not always, refer to perfection, completion. Seven is the number for something being complete, perfect, lacking nothing. Seven symbolizes 
perfection, whole, lacking nothing. Where are we getting this from? Let's go to Revelation 15, verse 1. Revelation 15, verse 1. I'm going to show you that. Revelation 15, verse 1. I got to unpack a lot of meat just to make this one point. This one point, I got to unpack all this meat. Listen now. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Why seven plagues? Because all it takes is seven plagues to make God's judgment complete. It's filled up. It's complete. Once it's complete, there's nothing to add any further. So why seven plagues? Because all it takes is seven plagues to complete God's judgment, his wrath upon the earth. Right? So you see that? It says it right there. Seven. Why seven? Because by these seven, God's wrath is filled up. It's complete. You, there's nothing to add anymore. That's why if you look at the NIV, it even translates it that way. First, last, one of you. Can you put the NIV? Revelation 15.1. It captures the notion of why seven. And I'll show you elsewhere where we get that seven symbolizes perfection. I saw in heaven another great marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues. Last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. You see? Why seven? And only seven, not eight? Because with them God's wrath is completed. Seven completes it. The number of completion. Not always. Seven doesn't always mean completion. So don't ever go around saying seven is always. No, 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 no. Seven can mean complete or it can actually refer to something that's actually seven. Right? Is that clear? Did I make my point there before I move on? I'm so exhausted that I'm sweating. Whew. Guys, you don't know. It takes a lot of energy to teach. But that energy comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's another passage where we get seven being symbolic of completion. You remember after God created the heavens and the earth in six days, he looked at creation. He said it was very good. Genesis 131. Genesis 131. Let's see. After he finished creating the heavens and the earth and everything in them in six days, he looked and what did he say? Genesis 131. He looked and what did he say? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So then what did he do when it was very good, complete in the sight? Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Watch what he does. Watch what he does. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, complete, finished complete and all the host of them it was completed and on the seventh day god ended his work his work finished was completed by the seventh day which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and god blessed the seventh day and sanctified it set it apart as a special day because that in it in that day he had rested from all his work which god created and made why the seventh day? Because seventh day, his work was finished. It was complete. There was nothing to add. It was very good. Complete. So do you see now that the number seven can mean complete, perfect. And if you're complete and perfect, you lack nothing. If you're perfect, complete, you lack nothing. James 1 verse 4. James 1 verse 4. James 1, verse 4. No, not necessarily daily light. It's implication, but it doesn't come out and say it, that that's the reason why seven times. It's implied. I'm giving you passages that are clear that seven means completion. Right? James 1, verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. See, if, if you cultivate patience, then you'll be perfect. And if you're perfect, you lack nothing. To be perfect means you're complete, you lack nothing. So now, seven, we've established what it means. Why seven horns on Jesus' head? Let's go to see what a horn is. Revelation 17, 12. What is a horn? What does a horn symbolize? What does a horn point to? Revelation 17, verse 12. Yep. Revelation 17, verse 12. 
And the ten horns which thou seest are ten kings. So notice a horn is a king. He saw ten horns, and those horns are ten kings. Ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So notice a horn is a king. A king is one who has power, who has authority, who has sovereignty. So why does Jesus have seven horns? Because the horns point to him being a king. But why seven horns? Because he's the only almighty king. The perfect king whose power is perfect, lacks nothing. But if you have power that's complete, that means you're almighty. So John is seeing Jesus appearing as the almighty king. The one whose power is complete and perfect and lacks nothing. And if it lacks nothing, he's almighty. Because only someone who's almighty lacks no power. You catch it? Jesus is being shown as the Passover lamb who's the almighty king of all creation. So then why seven eyes? Because what do you do with your eyes? You see. So John is telling you, Jesus sees everything that takes place perfectly. Nothing escapes his sight. Everything is before him, and he sees everything perfectly as it is. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. But why is it said that the seven eyes are the seven spirits? Let's go back and look at Revelation 5, 6. Seven eyes are the seven spirits. Why are they called seven spirits? Well, you're going to see here. Let's look at it again. Send Peter Sayers back to the hell that he belongs with his mommy, this dog. Get him out of here. Revelation 5, verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. What are the seven eyes? Which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, again, why seven spirits? Why seven spirits? Is it literally seven spirits, or is this also symbolic? God bless you, Josh. Symbolic of what? Why is the Holy Spirit depicted as seven spirits? Symbolic of what? Seven spirits? Symbolic of what? The Holy Spirit in all his perfection. The Holy Spirit... As being perfect, the Holy Spirit in all his perfection. That God's Spirit is perfect in all he does, in all his ways, and who he is. So seven spirits, symbolic of God's Holy Spirit being perfect in all his ways, in all his doings, in all his actions, in his person. So then why is the eyes connect with the Holy Spirit? Because that's John's way of saying Jesus, in union with the Holy Spirit, sees all things. Jesus, in union with the Holy Spirit, beholds all things. Jesus and the Spirit work together, and as they work together, they oversee all things and are aware of everything. It's talking about the perfect union of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Are you catching it? Do you see what it means now? Jesus and the Spirit together, inseparably, in union, see all things, are aware of all things, and are present everywhere. So it's not seven literal spirits. It's the Holy Spirit described as seven spirits. Did you get that? You understand now what seven means in reference to Jesus and the Holy Spirit? Jesus isn't literally a lamb with literally seven horns and literally seven eyes, and there aren't literally seven spirits. No, there may be seven angels, but the seven spirits are not literally seven spirits. That's symbolic language to describe the Holy Spirit as being all perfect, perfect in all his ways and all his deeds in his person. Now, why did I take all this time to unpack the symbolism? Because I wanted to establish the Holy Spirit is described as seven spirits, not because he's literally seven spirits. It's symbolic. So in other words, if someone says, does God have seven spirits? No. Why are they called seven spirits? That's God's Holy Spirit, who is one, described as seven spirits, 
because that symbolizes the Holy Spirit of God being all perfect in his person and in his ways and his deeds. That's all it means. Right? Now you guys want to know why I took all this time just for that point? Just to show you what seven doesn't mean and what it means? Because Revelation 1, 4 to 5 is a Trinitarian prayer. Here we have John starting Revelation with a prayer to the tr Trinity. Praying to the Trinity to bless the readers of Revelation. Revelation 1, verses 4 to 6. 4 to 5. We'll stop at 5. Okay. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace, grace, favor, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. That's one. From the seven spirits. That's two. Which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, that's the Trinity, which is, which was, which is to come, God the Father. Seven spirits, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Son. John begins his revelation with a prayer to the Trinity to bestow favor and blessing on all who read Revelation. Man, I'm fried. So here's another prayer to the Holy Spirit. But did you notice the order? He begins invoking God the Father, then the Holy Spirit, then Jesus. Did you catch it? Notice they don't care about the order. They'll start with the Father, go to the Spirit, and then to the Son. Or start with the Son and then go to the Father. The order means nothing to them. Why? Because all three are fully God, equally God. You can start with any one of them without dishonoring God. In other words, the father doesn't get upset, get upset and say, why did you mention my son ahead of me? How dare you? Jesus doesn't get upset when you mention the Holy Spirit before him. How could you mention the Holy Spirit ahead of me? How? No, that doesn't exist. The three persons of God are inseparable in perfect union of equal glory, majesty, and honor. There is no envy. They love one another perfectly, and they recognize the other as being fully God and equal to himself. Are you catching it? They all love one another perfectly, infinitely, and they recognize the others as being God equal to himself. The Son is just as much God as I am, and the Spirit is. Right? And they know that they are inseparable, interdependent, and they cannot be God Apart from the others. Catching it? So here's the Trinitarian prayer. But now let me give you the other Trinitarian prayer. And then Lord willing. Lord willing. We're going to do another session. In an hour. Uh, about an hour God willing. On Muhammad proving Jesus is God. But let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Now notice this order. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. Notice this order. And I'm going to sum up. Because I think these two sessions are. Enough to establish that you can pray to the Trinity. You can pray to the Trinity. Okay, here. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Okay, watch here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts with Jesus first. And the love of God, the Father second. And the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. This is an invocation of blessing. Did you catch it? Invocation of blessing. Where he ends his letter by invoking Jesus Christ, God the Father, Holy Spirit to grant their spiritual blessings on the church. Yes, yes, I, I, have, I have my Skype open, open up for the second session. So guys, I think I've given you ample proof, ample proof from yesterday's session and this session, these two sessions, ample proof as Trinitarians who, who believe the Bible is the true word of God and the God of the Bible is true and he is, he is real, he's alive, his Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you can pray to all three persons of the Godhead, right? All three persons of the Godhead. Lord willing, in an hour from now, it's now 1.54 p.m., 3 p.m., which is 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. One hour from now, God willing, one hour, be back. We're about 150. I want to see 200. Don't disappoint me, guys. Come back. We're going to do a session, which, again, is going to be about worship and prayer, but connecting with Muhammad. How Muhammad ends up proving Jesus is God. And it's still about worship and prayer. So can I count on you coming back?
We see 150. I want to see more, not less, in Jesus' name. For the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the glory of the Holy Spirit. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we love you. One more hour, Panus, Filippo, one hour. It's two now, three o'clock my time, 6 p.m., New York time, God willing. One hour from now, Lord Jesus willing. The triune God lives. The Father lives. The Son lives. The Holy Spirit lives. And may we live in them, through them, and because of them forever and ever in Jesus' name. Pray for my daughters that Jesus blesses them and protects them this time of, time of need. We love you. Amen.